Okay, so I'm Robert Markowitz, and, um, and I'm a children's performer, and, um, and, I, and I wrote this novel, Clown Shoes, but the topic for today um, is how to, how writers create fiction from their lives, and we're going to start with uh, Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, but the question I'm going to ask you before we start is, um, have you ever wanted to create fiction from, from your life? Have you ever thought of writing a story or a novel out of something that happened to you, but, but maybe to fictionalize it? And that's just a thought that I want you to stay with and we'll come back to it during the talk. Um, all right, so we're gonna go back to the beginning here. So we're gonna use uh, Hemingway's first novel, The Sun Also Rises, as uh, a template for how he created. Um, Hello, welcome in. Welcome in, what's your name? Penny, Penny Ackerman. Hi Penny, nice to meet you. Come on up, come on up front. We, we just have a very uh, intimate crowd here. Okay. I think I'll, I'll just start from the beginning since I haven't gotten very far. Okay. Um, Okay, so my first question to you is, have you ever wanted to write fiction from an event that happened in your life? Um, and what I'm gonna ask you too, if, that, if you have, just summon up that event, or you might wanna jot it down if you have a, a pen and paper, summon up what that event might have been that you might have wanted to fictionalize to uh, write a story or write a novel. Um, because the topic of this is how writers create fiction from their lives. And we're going to use as a template The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway, which was his first novel. It was his first novel, Sarah. And, um, and he wrote it from, from a trip he took to Pamplona, Spain in the mid-1920s. So, um, We're going to, in, in, in dissecting how writers create fiction from their lives, we're going to use four different uh, insights. One is that they find the deeper meaning of their, of their life. They raise the stakes. They create a human antagonist, and they shorten the time frame. And we're going to go over each one of those in, as far as it relates to The Sun Also Rises. Okay, so, oh, right. Um, okay. Okay. I think because we're trying to film it, I think it's not going to work. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Stephanie, but it distracts me. I, I, I'm sorry. It's okay. I, it was, it was a, a brave feat for you to try to attend. I appreciate it. All right, sorry about that. You guys, both, we've got, we've got um, Adrian and again, Penny. Can you indulge me to just let me start again and we won't have another interruption? <laughs> because because uh, I sort of did get distracted when, when Sarah was of course, kind of yeah. crying. We'll okay, that, yeah. so let's, let's go through it yeah. quick again. We're going to start here. Um, okay. How writers create fiction from their lives. I'm asking you to recall maybe an event in your life that you thought would make good fiction, that you might want to fictionalize this event either in a story or in a novel. And we're going to go back to that as we look at The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway, his first novel published in 1926. It was written from notes he took to a trip to Pamplona, Spain in the mid-20s. And um, we're going to dissect how he created fiction from that, his notes from that trip. We're gonna use these insights. He found the deeper meaning of the story, he raised the stakes of the story, he created a human antagonist when there really wasn't one, and he shortened the time frame of the story. So here is Hemingway and his little coterie. This is, the, this is the group that he went to Pamplona, Spain with in the mid-20s. 
there's Hemingway himself. Um, there is um, his wife in the center. I recognize her. I read a book about their marriage. Yeah, yeah. It was um, it was very important for him his their marriage because when they were living in Paris, the little income that she had kept them afloat. But isn't she also the one that lost all his? Works. You're right. Well, yeah. he, yes, okay. she did. When, when he went to New York, she followed him to New York, and she lost, most notably, the manuscript to the novel he had already written, along with a number of short stories, right. um, which actually was a, a, a benefit in disguise because then he had to kind of rewrite everything, and he kind of had it together by that time. So. Um, Yes, that's that's Hadley, his wife, and then the, the rest of them comprise the characters in the book. The sun also rises, but he gives them different names. So he went to Pamplona, Spain, with this group, and um, let's talk first about the first insight: find a deeper meaning. Now, what happened in Pamplona, Spain, with this group? Honestly, it was a lot of drinking, a lot of uh, promiscuity, a lot of petty cruelty among the members of the group. So really, we're talking about a, a bunch of expatriates behaving badly in Pamplona, Spain. It was a raucous time where, um, you know, it, there wasn't any inherent deeper meaning. So what does Hemingway do to create some kind of deeper meaning? Because he's writing a literary novel. Well, um, he starts the novel with the Gertrude Stein quote, you are all a lost generation. And what, what did Gertrude Stein mean by that? She was talking about the generation that fought World War I and all of the support people. And World War I was a hideous uh, catastrophe where people came back without their limbs, without their soul. It was a horrible, horrible war, trench warfare. I'm sure you're familiar with it. And so when Gertrude Stein said, you are all a lost generation, he's talking about these folks here, she meant that, um, that they had really, um, that the war had really destroyed their lives. <laughs> and so, so Hemingway uses that quote to deepen the meaning of the story. Now, the Hemingway character, and in fact, in the first draft of Sun Also Rises, the Jake Barnes character is called Hem. That's the main character. The Hemingway character um, is impotent from an injury that he suffered in the war. Now, that wasn't really true with Hemingway, but that's how he fictionalized it. He fictionalized that to create, again, the deeper meaning of the book, which is that the Jake Barnes and all of the friends in some way have been uh, handicapped by the war. They've been robbed of their of the meaning in the, of their lives. They've been robbed of their souls. And so even though there's not one war scene in the entire book, The Sun Also Rises, it becomes a war novel. And he uses the Stein quote to introduce that idea. All right, so that is how he created the deeper meaning. Let's talk about raising the stakes, which is insight number two. Again, as you can see by this picture, Hemingway comes to Pamplona, Spain with his wife, Hadley, and this coterie of friends. And in the book, all of these friends are represented. Actually, these two are created into one character. But all these book friends are represented in the book, except for one person, the wife. The wife. You got it. And he takes the wife out. Why? Well, let me ask you a question. See, Hemingway, at the time, was had, had a crush on and almost certainly had an affair with this character. In the book, she's called Lady Brett Ashley. And what is more poignant, a book about a man, Jake Barn, uh, Ernest Hemingway, having an affair and cheating on his wife, 
or the impotent Jake Barnes who can't consummate his love affair with, with the love of his life, Lady Bret Ashley, because he's impotent. Um, and of course he's unmarried in the book. So it raises the stakes of the story these, um, to, to take out his wife and to, and to have the main character as impotent um, and cannot, cannot consummate that relationship. Okay. So, um, this is a, uh, this is World War I, which has had such horrendous consequences. Here is Ernest Hemingway. He actually was injured in World War I. Was he rendered impotent? No. No, he was not. And um, this is a later picture of Lady Brett Ashley. Their pictures of her are hard to find. There's Hemingway, his wife, Hadley, and their little son, John Hadley. So at the time that he wrote The Sun Also Rises, he was married with a child. Um, let's go back to create the third insight, which is create a human antagonist. He does create a human antagonist in the story. And the human antagonist was his friend, who in the story he calls Robert Cohn. There he is with the glasses in the rear, with the bow tie. Now Robert Cohn actually was Hemingway's friend. His name was Loeb in actuality. Cohn is the name he gets in the, in the novel. He, the truth is he helped Ernest Hemingway publish his first book, which was not a novel. It was a book of short stories and poems. And he came from one of the wealthiest Jewish families in Manhattan. And he had some connections to publishers there. And he got Hemingway's first book published. He actually was a good friend of Hemingway. But what does Hemingway do to him in the book? Well, in actuality, Cohn had taken the Lady Brett Ashley character to San Sebastian, Spain. And they had cohabited in San Sebastian, Spain. They had had an affair. And then in the book, Lady Brett Ashley rejects Cone, and Cone reacts violently. So this was Hemingway's way of making Cone the human antagonist, the bad guy. In actuality, Lady Brett Ashley asked the Cone character to take her to South America after the San Sebastian trip, and he said no. So it wasn't as as exactly as Hemingway wrote in the book. Why? Because Hemingway was trying to create a human antagonist for the book, a bad guy. He did this by uh, omitting the fact that this was his friend who had gotten him published, omitting the fact that the affair with Lady Brett Ashley that Cohn had was much more complicated than, than he put lets out to be, and also by taking advantage of the fact that there was tremendous anti-Semitism uh, in the 1920s, and portraying Cohn as Jewish, and then the subtext is that he's less than a man. I was going to bring that up. Yeah. The fact that he chooses the Jewish guy as the antagonist. Yeah, anti-Semitism um, was was very high during the 1920s. I mean, obviously, it eventually led to um, to Hitler, and um, and and. Hemingway uses that. No matter how you might feel about Hemingway using anti-Semitism to make this guy a bad guy, does it work in a literary way? Yes, it does, because he, he creates this convincing uh, antagonist. All right. So finally, we have another insight, which is shorten the time frame of the book. Um, how does Hemingway do this in The Sun Also Rises? Well, he purposely uses a very condensed timeline. And anything that doesn't fit in that condensed timeline, he squeezes in. Like, for instance, there's a hunting trip, a fishing trip that he, that, um, he had taken in a past year, and he squeezes it into the time, past in the timeline. 
There's a backstory, of course, of him being injured in the Jake Barnes being injured in the war, and of him being nursed back to health by the Lady Brett character. That was all fictionalized, but um, Hemingway really was injured in the war and fell in love with a nurse who nursed him back to to health, but it wasn't uh, this character. Um, but Hemingway does not include that backstory. There are no scenes like that. He, he starts the action um, right when the action begins with uh, really no preface, and he ends the book right when the action ends. So he, he, con he condenses that timeline. Um, and what does that do? It makes the book more dramatic. It, um, you know, the more you can shorten the timeline and the more action that takes place in that condensed timeline, the more dramatic the story becomes. So let's just go over these four insights. He found a deeper meaning. Now what does that mean by deeper meaning? Like, like let's go back to, your, to the story you might have had in your mind. Um, what is a deeper meaning? It's also often called the theme. So the deeper meaning, some very common deeper meanings might be um, a, a, a novel of redemption, a novel of good and evil, um, a novel of, uh, uh, of, of uh, survival. These are some very common deeper meanings that novels have. One of them might fit your story. He raised the stakes. Can you change a fact in your story that might raise, raise the stakes? What fact did Hemingway change? He changed the fact of his wife being on the trip, right? That was a major fact that he changed. And he, that was to make the meaning deeper. Um, he also changed another fact, which is he has uh, a bullfighter character, Pedro Romero. And Pedro Romero ultimately wins Lady Brett Ashley because Pedro Romero exemplifies all the ultra, the alpha male qualities that Hemingway prized. So in a way, Pedro Romero is, a, is another Hemingway. He's an alter ego. And um, so he changes facts. Let's think about another story that you might be familiar with where one fact was changed and it made it uh, it raised the stakes of the story. Remember Eric Siegel's love story way back in the 70s? Um, I actually knew the woman who claims that she was the one who Eric Siegel fell in love with. Let me tell you something, she wasn't terminal. She's still alive. So Eric Siegel changed that fact. He made her terminally ill. That creates, that raises the stakes. And you might remember the movie, of course, with Ryan O'Neill and uh, yeah, Alan Grove. So, raising the stakes, he creates the human antagonist. He changes facts about Robert Cohn's character to make him even more evil, more of an antagonist. And he shortens the time frame. So those are more of an more evil. Evil. He wasn't evil. He wasn't really evil. Now he wasn't a perfect guy. He. He had left a wife and a few children along the way, so I'm, you know, but he wasn't evil. Um, okay, so we're going to take a quick break. That's that's a picture of Robert, the Robert Cohen character, whose real name is Loeb. We're going to take a, and these are scenes from the 1957 movie, The Sun Also Rises where they included scenes that Hemingway doesn't include of you know, him being injured, falling in love with the nurse. Uh, they had their own reasons for doing that, but Hemingway did not do that in his book. All right, there's a two minute break from listening to me, and it's kind of funny in my opinion. Yo, welcome back to Thug Notes. This week we search for answers at the bottom of the bottle with the sun also rises by Ernest Hemingway. After World War I, stunner Jake Barnes spending all his time in Paris sipping juice and writing. Something I like to call the good life. One night while throwing back some drink with a brother named Robert Cohn, 
Jake Peake some fine dame he used to holler at named Brett Ash. Even though they still got a thing for each other, Jake know that this girl too wild for him to handle. See, Jake got his junk straight f***ed up during the war, and ain't no little blue pills gonna fix that. To make things worse, Jake ain't the only one macking on Brett. Ever since she walked into that club, Cole's eyes have been straight glued to her ass. And he don't give a damn that she about to marry some thug named Mike Campbell. Ain't no thing, though, because Brett drops out of Jake's life like she always do, and heads to San Sebastian for a bit. A couple weeks later, Jake, Brett, and some homies decide they're going to hit up a bullfight festival up in Pamplona. But before they leave, Brett tells Jake on a down low that she was holding up with Cole the whole time she was in San Sebastian. Ooh, wait. During the festival, this whole gang of white folk peeped some young hood named Romero, who got the whole bullfight game sold up. Brett got her eyes on this stud, and it's not long before they start doing the nasty. Next day, Cone start flipping <laughs> demanding to know where Brett is, and straight bitch slaps Mike and Jake. When Jake comes to, he learns that Cone found Romero hot in bed with Brett and laid a whoop on his ass. Eventually, Brett and Romero peace out and hit the road together. But it ain't long before Brett calls Jake to Madrid, saying she dropped Romero and be flying solo again. On their way out, Brett said that her and Jake could have had a ball in time together. Jake just responds, isn't it pretty to so? think so? Alright, so now I'm just going to quickly tell you how I use some of those insights in writing clown shoes. Now again, I did, I did write clown shoes from a real event in my life, but I fictionalized it. The event in my life is that I was a criminal lawyer and I uh, had a practice in Palo Alto, California although I was brought up in Westchester. And um, I left being a criminal lawyer to become a children's performer, which is what I've done for the last 28 years. Um, I only had about four or five years as a criminal attorney. And so, so Clown Shoes is, is a story that reflects that reality, but using the same insights that we were talking about before, I, I fictionalized the story, and let me just tell you briefly some of the, some of the ways I did that. So we talked about finding the deeper meaning. We talked about Hemingway using the Gertrude Stein quote, "You are all a lost generation." Well, it is helpful to focus in on a certain quote as your theme, as your um, deeper meaning. And what I focused in on you can't change your outsides by changing something, you can't change your insides by changing something on your outsides. So in other words, what I was talking about is when I made this drastic career change, and it was drastic because one moment I was before, you know, I was in chambers with the judge deciding the fate of all those people in the gallery, and the next moment I'm being ushered down to a basement to, you know, a teeming group of kids who are spilling their cokes and smearing their cupcakes over everything and I'm told to entertain these kids so it was definitely a status drop to go from being a, a criminal lawyer to a, to a, a, a party musician and a, a musician that appears at schools and libraries. Um, but did that really change who I was? My answer really is, is we develop that throughout the novel. There's something that you change you know, drastic outer change in your life does it really convert who you are on the inside and I guess to to give you the short of it my answer is no but it can be an invitation because by saying that I'm going to put my own happiness above status money other people's opinions my mother was not very happy about this <laughs> believe me <laughs> um, you by putting your own happiness, you f it does start an inner change, a cycle of inner change. Um, so that was that's the deeper meaning of my book. Can you change your insides by changing something on the outside? Um, now, as far as raising the stakes, I did that in a lot of ways, but I'm going to just take one example. I left being a criminal law because I. I was burnt out. And also, 
I was burnt out because I probably didn't have the right temperament to be aware. I could do it intellectually, but I didn't have the right temperament. Um, but is that interesting in a novel? Not really. My character, uh, my character, he, my main character, he leaves the law because he's been representing a, a woman who has been charged with child abuse. He gets her off, and then in a second bout of this, she kills the child. Now, none of that is on the page. It's all backstory. But what that does is it creates, you can't change your insides with something on the outside. It creates an inciting incident. And it also begins a redemption arc. Because the question is, can he redeem himself from this horrible incident that he's had a part in by, by, being, by acquitting her. So can he redeem himself from the, the, um, the catastrophe that he was part of? So um, finally, let's talk about creating a human antagonist. In Clown Shoes, almost everybody is against this change that he, his mother, his brother, his girlfriend, his girlfriend's family, they are all human antagonists. And then later on, when he does try to redeem himself, there is another human antagonist, because he has to go, he, he doesn't want to be a lawyer, but he has to be forced back into that role to redeem himself. And um, so there's a whole team of human antagonists in Clown Shoes. And, um, Again, that's very important when you're writing because something like the glass ceiling, in other words, other obstacles, or like racism, or whatever obstacles there are, they don't grab a reader's attention like a human antagonist. So finally, I definitely condense the timeline in Clown Shoes. Uh, this whole event, you know, of me leaving law and finally doing what I'm doing now probably took a total of 10 years, but in Clown Shoes, the action takes place over just a little over a year. So that, what does that do? It heightens the drama. Okay, so there's one last thing that I'm going to add to these four insights, and that is it really helps if there is an impactful relationship that spans the entire story. And in that situation, um, I do have an impactful relationship, which is Clara and, um, and and Will. Will is the main character. Clara is the love interest, but she and Will uh, both spur personal change in each other. Will inspires her to leave her job because she's been wanting to make a documentary film. She continues to push Will beyond his comfort zone First, to um, he, she publicizes his career change before he's ready. She um, she forces him to visit the grave of the boy who was killed, the son of her of Will's client. She's constantly pushing him into situations that create personal growth, and he's doing the same to her. And what I would argue is that dynamic of personal growth and of a relationship that's fostering it is a very interesting dynamic and sort of needs to be present in, in a novel. Okay, so so this is a little drama. That's my daughter, by the way. There's a little quick dramatization of a, of a, of a scene. The characters are actually quite a bit older. My daughter's only 20 and that boy was just, but I just had them do a little scene there. Uh -huh. um, all right, so let's go over it one more time. Find the deeper meaning, raise the stakes, create a human antagonist, shorten the timeline, and include an impactful relationship that pervades the story. All right, we're almost done here. By the way, if you wanna either, um, you know, 
subscribe to my Substack blog, which um, usually has a, a one-minute read every two days, or um, or any of my other information. There it is. There's only five minutes left in the presentation, and I'm going to do a very quick reading, less than five minutes. Um, it's a scene that takes place in Larchmont, which you guys probably have been to. I lived and, there for 35 years. Oh, did you? Did you really? My father was a, a teacher at Marinick High School from 1951 to 1985. He was a teacher and then a guidance counselor. So I, I have some. I grew up in Marinick, so I have some um, connections with that too. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you try to solve a mystery. Remember we were talking about raising the stakes of the story. I'm going to read you a little scene, less than five minutes. I want you to listen and tell me. What major element of this scene do you think I fictionalized to raise the stakes of the story? So here we go. Uh, I'm going to take off my distance glasses. I'm going to put on my, um, well, I can read without it, but I had, I had, oh, there, there. OK, put on my reading glasses. All right. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so I'll set the scene. This is one of his first birthday parties after transitioning from a criminal lawyer to becoming a, a children physician. I parked my Chevy outside a Spanish tutor with six stone angels, five gargoyles, four copper wolf heads, and three lions. It's in the manor, if you know where that is. <laughs> um, I counted them. This wasn't my first birthday gig. I'd done one for the daughter of a church regular, which gave me the courage to place an ad in a parenting magazine. The marketing lady had asked me what name I used as a performer. Willie the Guitar Guy, I told her, my new identity. So here I was carrying an oversized backpack full of shakers, bells, puppets, armed with songs like Bossa Nova Boo Boo, Mr. Train. I rang the mansion's doorbell, an eight gong chime, the yellow rose of Texas. The birthday boy's mother came to the door. I knew by our phone conversation that she spoke with a French accent. Maybe the Texan was her husband. Here she was, pretty, petite, businesslike. I could swear I'd seen her before, and remembering faces was my specialty, whether last week or 10 years ago, never names. Her pupils flared. What? No costume. I couldn't imagine why she'd expect me to dress up. It might have been her way of accentuating our status gap. Since those initial clown shows, I never appeared in costume, and my ad pictured me in a Breton striped shirt. It was too bad because I had been disposed to like her, what with this being my second party, but now my antennae were up. She ushered me through the Tudor top door. Around the corner to the right was a spacious living room sprinkled with guests on couches and chairs. Servers in white shirts, bow ties, and black vests circulated with hors d'oeuvres. The lady of the house pursed her fingers, pursed her lips, and waved the finger. You must not let the adult guests see you, she said, leading me down a corridor to the left. Your place is in the basement with the children. She frowned. Please, if you must go to the toilet, use the one downstairs. It had come to this from an officer of the court, privileged to participate in making critical decisions about people's lives in the sanctity of a judge's chambers. I descended to basement level hired help. Below, the children were at war. Their shrieks and hysterical laughter were punctuated by the low guttural grunts one might associate with trying to capture a greased pig. The hostess closed the door against the noise. Temporarily, I was on the adult side. Who was this lady? I shut my eyes trying to place her. The answer came like bubbles rising to the surface of a lake. I saw her in my office, hair worn up, dour expression, contrite bearing. More bubbles emerged, and I remembered the plea bargain, a wet, reckless charge, dropped from driving while intoxicated. She'd blown a 1-5 on the breathalyzer. Anything less than admission as charged was a gift from the gods, and she was savvy enough to know it. I recalled her gratefulness, how she poured on the charm. But now, the great lady didn't remember me. Her charisma would not be wasted on a party musician. Where was the costume indeed? I shook my head. I, I, I can't both supervise the kids and perform the show. I need other adults down there with me for liability concerns, if nothing else. The 
corners of her mouth drooped to see well, she was not amused. She pushed the button on the wall, and presently two young women in matching aprons like guild servants from the Gilded Age appeared. <sighs> this explained her notion of the help wearing costumes. They will supervise, she said without emotion. Then slip me an envelope. Remember to use the toilet on the lower level and then exit through the garage. For a moment, I was tempted to show her that I knew an intimate fact about her life, her guilty plea to an alcohol-related reckless driving charge. My dignity was screaming for me to traverse the chasm between us with this privileged information. I warned myself not to do it. I'd chosen to leave that other life and freely exchange status to play the fool. That was not her affair. The final details of the case came to mind. The judge had sentenced her to attend AA meetings with an alternate to jail time, and it took all my will, but I restrained myself from asking how the court ordered meetings had gone. Willie the guitar guy had work to do. So that's the scene. Does anybody have a guess? of what I fictionalize in that scene to raise the stakes. Any ideas, any thoughts, any guesses? What did I fictionalize to raise the stakes of that scene? That you had, had a prior that you actually had a prior relationship with that's this it. person? That's it, you guessed right. Yeah, because you know the scene is about status. And it's about you know lowered status and to have her have to have had an interaction with her when my status was high and now having another interaction when my status was low kind of brings home that status theme and that scene so that's the sort of stuff that you're looking to do when you fictionalize your own life experience to take what's present in there, but to accentuate it in some way. And um, so that's, that's pretty much um, my message for today. And I do have books in case you guys are interested. They're $15. Um, and, um, you know, Clown Shoes has, as I said, it has a love story. It has a redemption arc. Um, it, it's, it's about creating a new identity. I don't know if you've ever lost an identity in your life and created a new identity. Sometimes death will have you lose an identity. Sometimes divorce can have you lose your identity. Losing uh, my identity as a criminal lawyer was sort of a big thing, but I did it because uh, I needed a life that more that suited you know, my creativity and um, so it's about identity and who we really are and, and how we can change both outside and inside. Um, so that's about it for today. Okay, thank you. Uh, Q&A, no questions? Oh, sure, of course. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody does have a question. Can I start by Yes, go ahead, please. I think you, you mentioned this before, but why did you choose to fictionalize the story? Because to me, um, you know, working with you, being a children, wonderful children's musician and a songwriter for years, that I would be very interested to read more of just straight autobiography. That's a great question. And actually, um, I do have an answer for it, which is, uh, let me, I want to, um, I don't know where I, what I do with my clicker here. Let me see, maybe it's back here. Okay. Um, see, I wrote an art in 2015. I wrote an article for the New York Times, and that actually on the right is the artwork that the Times put in the article. And I was surprised, and you know, this shows me with my my wingtips and trading and you know money over the desk and clown shoes because there was an interim time when I was a party clown which I didn't mention but this article was for three days it vacillated between being the second 
and third most read article in the New York Times for three days. It got about 500 reader comments, um, you know, which are added to the article. You've seen that, and um, and I realized that, you know, some people were saying, "Wow, you know, I, I admire what you did. You followed your heart, you know." And other people were saying, "Hey, look, buddy, I got a family to support. You know, I don't know what you're doing." So it it it, it really had quite a reaction, and I thought. Uh, I might have something here. I think I'd like to tell the story in a, in a way that um, might be universal. So that that's really the answer. That was a great question. I appreciate that. That, that was the answer to that. Um, anything else about writing or? I, I have to be honest. I mean, I'm thinking about what you're saying here, and I feel like I don't think my life is too boring to come up with anything like this. Well, I mean, like we were talking about identity, right? Um, did you ever have a an experience in your life where sort of the, the self-concept that you had was, for, for one reason or another, it, it, it kind of went down the drain? Like you had a some incident, like usually death, divorce, um, sometimes a change of professions, um, where you had to create a new self-concept or at least look at the old one. Did you ever have an incident like that? I don't think so. <laughs> <Not either. laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, actually, my brother. Who lives in White Plains? Um, he has always been a great athlete, and his son is a great tennis player. He's like ranked 18 for his age. He's 17 years old in the country. So he's always a great athlete, and he always depended on moving and playing sports for his identity. And recently, he's had to have two operations, one after the other where right now he can't put any weight on one of his legs and he's completely, it destroyed his self-concept, totally destroyed it. He went into a deep depression. I mean, it's interesting how that can happen. So that's, I find that, personally I find that interesting. Other people have other types of um, events that they can fictionalize, you know. But I find the whole thing of, of self-concept, which is also what my blog is about. Mm -hmm. It's called Identity, and it's it's only about a minute read each time, but it's a it's always about our self-concepts and how they can be, you know, what's really underneath them. So that those are just some ideas. Traumas, right? Uh, exactly, uh, that's the word. I mean, if you if you don't have a dramatic ins, uh, inciting incident, I mean, that's Joseph Campbell, right? Because that's kind of a, a really a pretty large scale concept, but everybody must have, I wouldn't say must, but majority of us have some traumas. Not, if not from childhood or from adolescence. Nobody have ever have lost love, you know. Like there's must be a lot of conflicts and uh, unsettling feelings, you know, somewhere, and that could be a really good story for other people. How do you come out of it? How do you cope with it? And how do you grow? Because I think the growth, the redemption arc, it's another big word, but that usually it's the growth of the character. Does this character become more? Uh, Gain some wisdom through, you know, through the trials and the tribulations. Yeah, I think yeah. I think Teresa and I are similar in that way. I find that very interesting. You know, the personal growth of a, of a character. It's Shakespeare. I mean, it's really traced back to. I mean, I, I was English major, so you always go back to the archetype because Shakespeare's is all you know in the tragedies, all his tragedies. He, do they grow? Or did it like Macbeth didn't grow? You know, he actually reversed. You know, he didn't. He become like darker and then 
lost his understanding of life. You know, he become not become more what the other can become wiser. You know, and sure. become less. And wiser. isn't it fascinating that Shakespeare was dealing with those themes way before Freud? You know, there was no study oh, of psychology. Yeah. There was no, yeah, you know, but it's all about human psychology. Yeah. yeah. I'm lucky I have, my wife's is a psychotherapist and her specialty is trauma, so I have somebody in the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, well, this is a, a lot of stuff to absorb. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a big flip from memoir writing to fiction, I think. Well, you know, some of these principles, obviously you can't change facts in them. In a memoir, but what you can do is you can emphasize certain things. You can emphasize themes that are universal in your memoir. So you can't actually change facts to create a deeper meaning or to raise the stakes, but your emphasis matters a lot. What you choose to focus on. Anyway. That's what I have to offer today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thanks. much. I hope you want to read a copy of Robert's book. It's really fantastic. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. <laughs>